Hello, good morning for those of you joining us. Again, we will start our program in just a moment. Oh, wow, I'm seeing a lot of thumbs up and lots of hearts. This is fantastic. All right, thank you, thank you for joining us. All right, it's 11 o'clock. Thumbs up. If you guys are ready to get started, I'm seeing lots of thumbs up. <laughs> Excellent. So hello, good morning, or shall I say almost good afternoon. Uh, welcome to today's program. We have a very special program for you today, and it's called What's the Scoop on Invasive Species? So thank you all for joining us uh, for this very special Portscast program. And as I mentioned, it's about invasive species. Uh, my name is Jennifer and uh, I will be your host today. So I'm really, really excited that you're joining us. I'm excited that you guys, I'm seeing a lot of responses here. It's wonderful. Um, also joining us from the field today, I'm gonna bring some of our interpreters and special guests into view here. Uh, we have interpreters from California Department of Fish and Wildlife. We also have California State Parks joining us. As a matter of fact, we are live with Virginia at Elkhorn Slough Reserve. Hi, Virginia, give us a wave. Say hello to everybody. Hey, everybody. Good to All see right. you. All right. And we also have Jen, Parker, and Brittany all joining us live from Gaviota State Park as well. Good morning. Morning. Good morning. Awesome. And so I'd like to show everyone where we are located, where our sites are that you're um, going to be visiting today. So you can see here on our map, we've got Gaviota State Park, uh, more in Southern California. And as you move up the coast, uh, you land there at Elkhorn Slough Reserve. Okay, so hopefully that gives everybody a little sense of place and where you're joining us for our special Portscast program today. So everyone that's tuning in today that's going to learn firsthand of what invasive species are and how they're in, impacting our environment. Um, our presenters will showcase the work that uh, restoration scientists are doing to combat this issue and also lead us into a discussion about um, opportunities in the field of environmental science. So this is pretty exciting, uh, this discussion and um, opportunity that we get to have today with all of our interpreters and special guests that are joining us. And hey, if you stick around until the end of this program, you'll also have an opportunity to ask our interpreters and some of our special guest uh, experts some questions. So stick around until the end um, and hopefully you'll get that opportunity to ask us some questions as well. So you might be asking yourselves, uh, why is California Department of Fish and Wildlife and California State Parks teaming up for a topic on invasive species? And, and really the answer is pretty simple. Uh, we're all working together as sister agencies to, um, to uh, towards a common goal. And that common goal is to restore our native ecosystems. It's really important and together we can do that. Have you guys heard the term teamwork is dream work? It's true, it absolutely is true. And you can be a part of this endeavor as well. And we'll get into that a little later in the program. So another question many of you might be asking yourselves is what is an invasive species and how are they different from a native species? And so these are some of the things that we're gonna get into and, and, and clarify and define for you. So let's go head on over to um, Gaviota State Beach for that answer. But Parker, before you uh, dive into that explanation, give us a sense of where you are, maybe a little bit of information about California State Parks. Yes, thank you so much, Jennifer. Um, it's so great to be here. Welcome everyone. My name's Parker. I'm here at Gaviota State Park today. Super excited to have you all at one of our 280 state parks across the state of California. And these places, I really like to say, belong to all of us in California. This is your place. Everyone joining here today, everyone in California, I just want you to remember that these parks, these places are a place for everyone. And um, that's really why it is all of our job. It's not just the scientists and the other people that work for parks. It's not just their job to manage it. It's all of our jobs, especially for those inspiring environmental scientists out there who are joining us today. All important things to remember. But 
as I mentioned, California state parks, we have 280 of these state parks along our coast. I'll show you around our, our state park here today, but our state parks encompass 340 miles of coastline. You might even see the coast out here behind us today and our incredible train trestle that's right behind us here. I'll give you a hint. It's uh, 811 feet long. It's the final link of railroad between Southern and Central California, which is pretty special, especially when we talk about our history and our historic sites. Now, that's one of our historic features here along our coastline. Might also see our waterways, too. State parks have so many different waterways, whether it's lakes, rivers, streams, just like Gaviota Creek here, which starts up in our mountains. And really, state parks are from our coasts to our mountains, our hills, our valleys. All of those are just incredible ecosystems that we all want to work to protect, but also really fun places to go and fun trails too. You can even go up to the hills behind us here. Um, I know they're all laden with mustard. We'll find out about that mustard a little bit later on, um, but uh, super exciting stuff there. And, you know, state parks, when it comes to really what are those invasive species, right? Because that's what we all are here to talk about today. And really invasive species are those species that aren't from here. They're not from California. Sometimes they were brought here or they were accidentally brought here and they just spread really rapidly. And a lot of times that they'll just take over. They will crowd it. Imagine like if a whole bunch of people just like were in your classroom right there and you had maybe like 100 people in a small room of like 30, that would be pretty tight, right? And that is kind of like what happens with those plants as they're growing. They crowd them out and they make them grow. And I, I did bring one of my absolute favorite crowders today to share with you. Would you all like to see that? Oh boy, I figured you would. All right, here it is. It's this stuff. This here is called Arundo Donox. Can you all say it with me? Are you ready? Arundo Donox. All right. I hope you all said it out there today, but this is one of our cane species. And it is indeed a highly invasive plant species because it takes over. It loves the creek here, especially up a little bit more. We see a bunch of this and it likes to take up all of that water. Water is so important to us here, but takes up that water here and it spreads quite rapidly with its roots. I'll show you its root here. We call this a rhizome. These really, really spread. And in order to remove these, well, the easiest way is to really remove it by hand. And so imagine like digging in the ground there. That's what people do just to get rid of this stuff as it really takes over. I got one more spreader here before I pass it back to you, Jennifer. And it is this spreader and crowder, this stuff. All right, beautiful flower there, beautiful lush leaves on it. But indeed, like our Arundo, it likes to spread, it likes to crowd out those other things. And it also likes to suck up a lot of water. If I break open one of these leaves here, there's just like so much liquid on the inside there, but Yep, this ice plant here was something that was brought for erosion control to control erosion. But I don't know how successful they were because it is quite a nuisance. And a lot of places really work to remove that plant there. But, you know, all right, I'll send it back to you, Jennifer, to discover some more. And I'm sure we'll see you again shortly. It's so wild to think that some of these beautiful things like you just shared are a nuisance. You know, that's such a such a pretty flower that you just shared. And I want to try this, Arundo Donax. Did I get that right? Yes, you did. Awesome. I love it. <laughs> well, so, so what's the problem? I mean, why are invasive species harmful to our ecosystems? I, I mean, I think that's really the big question here. So let's go to Virginia over at uh, Elkhorn Slough Reserve. And, and maybe, J Virginia, can you share some, uh, some examples and explain a little bit what, what's so harmful about invasive species in our ecosystems. Sure. Hey, everybody. Welcome to the Elkhorn Slough Reserve. First of all, Jennifer and State Parks, thank you so much for inviting California Department of Fish and Wildlife to be part of this important podcast, this important conversation about invasive species. 
the difference between a non-native and invasive native, it's a lot of words for us to think about. And that's what we're going to be um, unpacking today together. So to begin with, I want to welcome all of you that are joining us today and invite you to the Elkhorn Slough Reserve. If you look around me, you'll see this beautiful 1700 acre ecological reserve owned and managed by Department of Fish and Wildlife. And while we're very similar in a lot of ways to state parks, we have trails for the public to come and enjoy. We have school programs such as this. We also have a team of scientists and our scientists and our stewards are out there studying the habitat, studying the plant species, studying the animals that use these habitats to better understand how we can manage and protect and preserve incredible places like this. So the, one of the things that's really critical for the Department of Fish and Wildlife to think about and to manage is invasive species. So as Parker pointed out, we have non-natives. These are plants that aren't from California. They're brought here for a lot of different reasons. They may even blow in from the wind, right? But they're here now. And what happens is that over time, they become invasive. That means they grow they spread out of control. And you can see behind me probably a lot of what looks like beautiful greenery is a lot of invasive plants. The Department of Fish and Wildlife takes the, um, the, the management of invasives very seriously. So we work hard to, um, to reduce the negative impacts of these species because they can be very impactful to ecosystems and to the other species that we find there, the native ones, right? So part of that is we begin with prevention. So we think about how do these animals, how do these plants get into the system in the first place, and how can we prevent it? That's our first line, right? So a great example is, and I've got a cute picture of a really cute little critter here. This is a red-eared slider turtle. And so you might go into a pet store and you see this and you think, wow, that's going to be super fun to take home with me. And you may set it up in an aquarium. But what happens sometimes is that people outgrow their pets. They decide, mm, I don't want it any longer. I'm not interested. For whatever reason, you decide that you don't want that turtle any longer. What we want people to do is stop and think about what's the best thing to do now. What we don't want to do is put it out into a native California pond. We don't want to do that. What we want to do is think about what are some alternatives. So maybe that's taking it back to the pet store. Maybe that's taking it to the school and offering up to a teacher to put it in an aquarium in the class. So lots of kids can enjoy this um, red-eared slider turtle. But most importantly, what the department likes to say is don't let it loose, okay? We're not letting it loose out into the environment so that it can be impactful to the food system, to the, um, to the various critters that already naturally live there. So again, I'm going to remind you, don't let it loose. And I'm going to throw it back to Jennifer and to the team in Gaviota. And let's hear a little bit more about native plants and native, I'm sorry, invasive plants and invasive animals. Hey, thank you, Virginia. And, and gosh, you know, I've, I've heard so many stories over the years of folks releasing their pets into the wild. And honestly, I think a lot of people don't realize the extent of the negative impacts that that decision has um, on our, on our ecosystems, right? Um, and so my question now is, and this is for California State Parks, how are you addressing invasive species and the introduction of invasive species? Yeah, awesome. That was so great, Virginia. I loved hearing about that, you know, and that's such a great message to really share is to not let it go, to not release it out into our places that we love so much. Remember, that's something that all of you can do at home, right? Is to do your part by helping our environment, by making sure that we're not letting those creatures out or we're not buying those creatures in the first place to become those pets. And you know, State Parks really um, takes a similar approach to the California Fish and Wildlife and um, preventing and restoring our habitats from invasive species. We'll find out a little bit more about that here, about one of the sites that we have that's just over that way from us. And um, I'll leave you kind of wondering about that a little bit more, but um, there are a number of different um, partner agencies, whether they're government organizations like our awesome sister agency at the Department of Fish and Wildlife, or even volunteer organizations too that work with park sites all throughout the state of California to address invasive species, whether it's their prevention or 
um, removal or doing education like what we are doing today. And I really want to encourage you all too to um, take some of these things that we're saying today um, and to be able to share those with others who may not have been able to do that. That's something that we all can do here in California is just to share our knowledge with others. And, and speaking of those uh, spreaders too that people uh, let out, got another one here. Yep, it's not just uh, those, those pets that people release, it is also plants. So this one here is actually really kind of sharp, serrate edges here that it has. It's a little fluffy, a little sticky when I feel it might look like a little broom it grows like this and it can get up to 10 feet tall and six feet wide so i want you to imagine that probably a little bit taller than your classroom there and probably about as wide as what your door would be tall and it has this beautiful plumage on the top that a lot of people like i'll share that with you here here it is so quite beautiful you might have recognized this before you might see it in your gardens or um, landscaping, a lot of people use it because it is quite beautiful. But this here is our friend, the pompous grass. And this is one of those many different uh, grass species that are found here in California. This is another species that is not endemic, it's not from our area, it's from other parts of the world, but really has spread. And we see quite a bit of this here in our local state parks where we are today. And, um, but yeah, this was actually a species that was released um, from agriculture in Goleta, which is near Santa Barbara, just down the way here, about 150 years ago. They were growing a lot of it to sell in nurseries, and they're also using it um, in parades and floats because it's just so beautiful and it's also so soft. Um, but yep, pompous is another one of those things. And all right, like that pompous stuff. I even have brought a grass. Grasses are something else that we do see a lot of here in our landscapes, uh, especially here along the Gaviota Coast. Um, agriculture and um, cattle grazing has really removed a lot of our endemic ecosystems. And we're really left with just grasses here that have just started to grow. So I'll send it back to you all, though. Wow, that pompous grass is another cool looking plant, right? But Pompous no. grass has got to go. It does. <laughs> got to go. Oh, 10 feet tall. I just can imagine how easy that overcrowds uh, uh, an environment very quickly. Nice. So thank you for sharing that, Parker. And, and, and I'm really I'm really glad to hear and happy to hear uh, that California State Parks is, is uh, you know, taking a variety of approaches um, in this battle against invasive species, which is obviously so, so important. Um, so now let's go back over to Elkhorn Slough and take a closer look um, at some of the invasive species that are really affecting their park. So Virginia, what, what would you like to share with us? All right, welcome back everybody here at the Elkhorn Slough Reserve. Yeah, so let's talk a little bit about impact. Why do we care so much about these invasive species? So um, here at the Elkhorn Slough Reserve, we really have a problem with an invasive plant. And so again, if you look over the sh my shoulder here, and you look in the distance, you're going to see a dairy barn. And what it is, is that this area, these 1,700 acres, used to be an active dairy. And with those cows came a lot of non-native plants. So some of those were planted for feed, so different grasses. And we're not a dairy any longer. So these grasses now have grown so thick that um, our native plants don't have an opportunity to, um, to come back. So in addition, there's also a lot of different other sorts of invasive plants. Some of the things like, like Parker was talking about as well that have come in. One of those is called poison hemlock. And I have some also just sort of um, behind me here. And what's interesting about poison hemlock is that if you look at it up closely and you look at the leaves of it, it's actually related to the carrot. So if I was to pull it out of the ground, there's going to be a long white root that looks like a carrot. But its name tells you something very important. It is poisonous. It'll make you very sick. So we don't want to deal with it no matter what. Um, but we don't want it in our ecosystem either. As you can see behind me, it's very dense. It's mostly these invasive grasses and things like that. Another one is the radish. 
So nice little white flowers, and we see it from a distance, and we think, wow, great little flowering plant. But again, it's a non-native. It's not from California, and we call it invasive because it's spreading, and it's spreading everywhere, and it pushes out the native plant. One more I'll share with you is the thistle, and the thistle is an awful plant. It is prickly. Um, it will poke into your fingers if you try to pull it out. It's really difficult to manage. It comes in very thick and dense. And again, non-native and invasive because it spreads really easily. And so these are the kinds of plants that we're dealing with here, along with some others. And one of those I wanted to share with you about is the eucalyptus tree. So probably all of you have eucalyptus trees in your neighborhood or somewhere in your town. Or if you've been driving, you've seen them along the coast or in the hills. So a eucalyptus tree was actually brought in. And like Parker was pointing out, sometimes these were planted to be for landscaping and sometimes for other uses. So maybe for lumber or for the wood that they provided. The problem again is they were brought in from someplace else. They are non-native. They were brought from Australia actually. And what we've seen over the last hundred years is that they do spread and that we find them oftentimes around our freshwater ponds. And because of their root system, they're able to drain upon. They can suck that water out faster than the native plant. So that's a problem. That's an impact. Now that's something we're talking about is how do these invasive non-natives impact our ecosystem? So draining a pond is a problem. In addition, what we see in these thick, thick areas of eucalyptus tree is that the leaves, the branches and the bark fall to the ground. And instead of breaking down nicely, they actually begin building up and become very thick and very dense. This is also impactful because it doesn't give the space for those beautiful native plants that we, we see maybe in an oak forest, um, like, like uh, wood mint and different things like that that we would want to see in, an, in our native oak forest. And um, so these are impacts to our native plant system, but these native or rather invasive plants can also be and impactful to our local species. So the example I want to share with you is that on our eucalyptus growth, what we were seeing is, is an impact to our native amphibians. So does everybody know what an amphibian is? Yeah, it's related to a frog. So we're talking frogs and salamanders, right? So these are critters that need to be in the water, right? They spend some of their lifetime in the water and they need that. But they also spend some of their lifetime up above. And because of their soft, moist skin, they need to be someplace out of the sun. So oak forest under the leaves is a really nice habitat. So what I'm gonna share with you now are some of my three favorites because we have them here at the Elkhorn Slough Reserve. And these are very rare species. The first one is the Santa Cruz long-toed salamander. So these salamanders, like their name says, are from the Santa Cruz area here in the Monterey Bay area. They are only found here. It's the only place in the world that you're gonna find a Santa Cruz long-toed salamander, but they're very, very rare. And their habitat is critical and it's critical for us to protect it. So these freshwater ponds, and these underneath areas where they can get under the oak trees are really important. Another would be the um, red-legged frog. So we have red-legged frogs here, another amphibian that needs freshwater ponds and needs light uh, leaf litter underneath oak trees. And the third one, one of my favorites, is the California tiger salamander. Look at that smile on his face. So cute. Well, the California tiger salamander is, again, another one of these rare amphibians that we have here at the Elkhorn Slough Reserve that we're thinking about how do we protect their habitat. And the most important thing that we could do was to remove the eucalyptus trees, right? To date, and it's so exciting, in the last couple of years, we removed over 1,500 eucalyptus trees from the reserve. And this has been a collective effort by our stewardship and our restoration team. And I'm really excited because I'm going to get to share a little bit about what we do in regards to restoring once we remove the non-natives, but we're going to do that in a little bit. What I want to do now is pass it back over to Gaviota because I understand that they have red-legged frogs also. So back to you. Yes, 
thanks, Virginia. Yes, definitely. We do also have red-legged frogs down here. Um, and they're not only at this park, but several other parks um, in this uh, Central Coast District here. And um, I just wanted to see if you guys know what the term endangered species means, because these red-legged frogs are an endangered species. Have you heard of that term before? Yeah? And what that means is that endangered species is there's such a small number of those animals left that they run the risk of going extinct, which means that they're no longer on, on the earth anymore. And we definitely don't want that. We want them to be around for future generations and for years to come. So uh, we really need to protect these endangered species like the red-legged frogs so that they don't go extinct. So I wanted to touch on um, one of the invasive animals that we have here that can affect the red-legged frog. And I'm going to um, bring up a picture here to share with you. So here we have our red-legged frog. And you can see um, some of the egg masses that they have there. Um, this picture was taken at a, a creek nearby here. So you can see. The egg masses look like algae, actually. They're very hard to see in the water. And so one of the species really affecting the red-legged frog is this big American bullfrog. This big guy, he gets up to be eight inches long. So he's much bigger than the red-legged frog at only about four and a half inches. So not only are they larger in size, but they can have um, a longer breeding season and a double clutch of eggs um, in the breeding season. So they can um, out reproduce um, the red legged frog and kind of take over. But because they're so big, um, they also actually eat red legged frogs. So they will eat the tadpoles, the eggs and the adults. So that can, that can really impact um, the red-legged frog population. So that's a species that we definitely want to keep an eye on. And another species, oh, actually, before I move on to another species here, um, the creek where that egg mass photo was taken was here at this creek here at um, El Capitan State Beach. And what we've done to protect the egg mass until the the tadpoles get big enough to swim away is we've roped off this area to protect the habitat and keep people out of there and from disturbing them until they get big enough to um, move out of the area. So that's one thing um, that State Parks does to try to help uh, the vulnerable egg masses when we find them. All right, and also I wanted to share two other really cool fish species that are also endangered species that we have here in our park. Um, and another animal that is also invasive. Let me pull that up here. And that is the Southern Steelhead Trout. Have you guys ever heard of that animal before? So we've got our Southern Steelhead Trout and our Tidewater Goby that we're gonna talk about. So southern steelhead trout are kind of like a salmon um, where they are what's called an anadromous fish. Can you guys say anadromous fish? Anadromous fish. And that just means that they're born in a freshwater creek like this one um, that I'm standing at here at Gaviota. And when they get older, they migrate out to the ocean into the salt water and they get older. And once they're ready to lay eggs and reproduce, they migrate back up the stream that they were born in and they lay their eggs in the creek. And so steelhead can do that multiple times in their life, which makes them really special because salmon only do that one time in their life. So we also have this really adorable, cute little fish called the Tidewater Goby here um, at the bottom. And they only get to be about two inches long. So very tiny fish. And they can tolerate um, large fluctuations in uh, creek temperatures and salinity. So when you've got the ocean water coming in and out, they can really tolerate that, that salty, brackish water. 
And so these fish, um, they are an endangered species and they are susceptible to our red swamp crayfish, which is our other invasive species. And so these guys are pretty aggressive. I don't know if you've ever confronted a crayfish, but they will often throw up both of their claws and kind of come at you. They are pretty aggressive. And these guys are omnivores, which means that they eat um, plants, insects, um, a lot of different things. But they also eat um, amphibian eggs, so like frog eggs, like the red-legged frog, uh, fish eggs, tadpoles. And so that really makes the southern steelhead trout, the tidewater goby, and the red-legged frog on the menu for the red swamp crayfish. So these crayfish were introduced um, about 90 years ago, um, fishermen were using them as bait to catch largemouth bass in, um, in lakes and things like that. And somehow they were uh, left behind or got loose and were released out into the environment. And now they've kind of established themselves in our freshwater creeks here. So that's one of the animals to um, watch out for as an invasive species. All right, I'll send it back to you, Jennifer. Oops. Yeah, I have to say, I, I have never been confronted by a crawfish, uh, but I have to say those claws look pretty formidable. <laughs> and they Maybe definitely, yeah, I, I, don't, I don't want to confront one. They definitely sound like, a, like a, an aggressive, invasive species that yeah. Unfortunately, you know, might be good on my dinner plate, but certainly is not good in our ecosystems, right? So thank you, Jen, for, for sharing um, a little bit with us about those some of those invasive animals um, that, that you all are having issues with there at Gaviota State Park. Um, so, but now let's talk about how California State Parks and the Department of Fish and Wildlife are trying to stop the introduction of uh, invasive plants by encouraging gardeners and homeowners uh, to plant native plants. That's something that I'm actually, that's an ongoing project in my own home, um, as I have learned about a lot of the native plants and non-native plants that are in my area and trying to create a garden um, that, uh, that would support a natural environment of, of native plants. Um, so Virginia, I think you're, you're gonna talk with us and share a little bit about <clears throat> Elkhorn Slough's native uh, plant stewardship program, which I think we're all really excited to hear more about. Sounds great. Thanks, Jennifer. And wow, I am so glad we don't have bullfrogs here. Those are awful looking. Thankfully, our red-legged frogs don't have a lot of um, animal predators um, per se that are not native. Um, we just have to worry about that eucalyptus tree. So as I was saying about eucalyptus trees, um, it's not just enough to remove these invasive species right? So we clear a field or we take out these eucalyptus forests. What's really important is for us to think about the long term. What we want to do is restore. What we want to do is bring back the native ecosystem so that it works well, right? We talk about ecosystems connecting, habitats connecting, animals being able to move through these different habitats. Well, what we want to do is restore. And what that involves is bringing in and bringing back native plants. So the Elkhorn Slough Reserve has a beautiful native plant nursery. We have a greenhouse and we've got this wonderful area where our team of volunteers and staff are working, working collaboratively to collect and clean seeds and do all these great things, getting them ready for us then to take them out to these different sites. So an area where we clear eucalyptus trees we're gonna be taking and putting oaks in. Areas where we clear a lot of invasive grasses, we're gonna be creating meadows and restoring again the connectivity between these different habitats. In order to do that, we have an amazing team of stewards that work in our native plant nursery. And one of those, well, I have a special guest, um, Kalipai Semesat is going to be joining us. And here she is, Kalipai, come on in. Hi, everyone. Yay. So Kalipai is actually our native plant nursery specialist. Did I get that right? Nursery production specialist. Ooh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> Even bigger title, right? That's how important she is. But because Kalipai knows about, well, I've been holding this guy here. This is my favorite native plant. This is the California sage. And I wish you all could smell this because it smells amazing. And I often 
get home and I have one of these in my pocket at the end of the day because they're so incredible. And that's one of the things I love about native plants is something like that. But Kalipa here is the expert. So she's working in that nursery area, getting things ready to take out. But I want her to share. So tell us, tell us about your job. What do you do here? I assist with propagating the native plants. So I grow native plants by seeds, cuttings, or divisions. And then I tend them and help with planting for them to go back into the restoration sites within the Alcon State Watershed. I'm curious. How do you how do you clean seeds? I hear this all the time. We clean seeds here. How do you clean seeds? Well, it starts with collecting them, and it's it's a big job, so we usually do it with volunteers. Nice. And we remove them from all of the the plant parts that mm -hmm. gets like a little dusty and messy, and we kind of sometimes have to blow off parts of the plant that's not the seed so that we just have the, the, the seeds that ready to be planted. Cool. I bet it takes a lot of work because seeds are so small, right? Um, so how did you get into this line of work? Um, it started with just hiking and really enjoying nature and just noticing all the beauty and wanting to learn more. So I took a, uh, a naturalist class, and it gave more meaning to, to the hike. And, um, and then when we learned about native plants, uh, we had a botanist come in, and and we kind of oh wait, got, botanist. Botanist is a plant scientist. Yes, okay, new word for all of you. <laughs> <laughs> and um, and then I just fell in love so with with the native plants, and I I enrolled into a horticulture program, and then I worked at California Native Plant Nurseries, and I started my own at home, and then um, I ended up here, and I get to grow plants and help restore them back into the earth. That's beautiful. So how long have you been at the reserve? For um, a year and a half. A year and a half. Wow. So look at this. This is a great job. If any of you are interested in native plants and planting, this is the kind of work that you might want to think about getting into. Um, so I'm curious, what is your favorite native plant here at the well, Elkhorn Sea Reserve? Pick one when you love all of them. But I picked out a trio of meadow plants. We have our our California state grass, okay. the purple needle grass, and then this blue-eyed grass and California buttercup. And they're all perennial. perennial wow. plants. Look at these. All right, everybody say buttercup. Isn't that a great flower? That is beautiful. These are amazing. Thanks for bringing those to share with us. They're very easy to grow at, in your own garden as well. Yeah, and do you, um, when you plant them out into our restoration sites, are you planting just one or two? I mean, what kind of numbers are we talking about? Um, definitely up to two to hundreds, two thousands at a wow, time. Wow, that's amazing. <laughs> that is amazing. I heard that on one of our restoration sites, uh, Hester Marsh, there were thousands of plants that went in, right? And, did, yeah. and you grew most of those. Yeah, yeah. definitely not by myself. <laughs> <laughs> right? Because we do have a team of amazing volunteers who come out and help us in all aspects of the work that uh, Kilipai and the team are doing, but then also getting out there and following up afterwards because there's some care that goes into it afterwards, a lot of pulling of weeds to maintain these sites. Uh, this is amazing. So Kalipai is going to step off right now, but she's going to join us again later. So if you have any questions about native plants, any of the different ones that you saw today, or how to grow your own, um, she'll be back later to, to share that with you. So thanks so much. All right. So um, I guess I'm passing it back that direction. Yeah. So Virginia, thank you so much for sharing information about Elkhorn Slough's uh, Native Plant Stewardship Program. I think it's, it sounds like a really incredible and very important program to have there in your park. And, and, it's, and it looks like you get a lot of um, participation from volunteers. And, you know, these are the sort of opportunities that some folks are looking for that people that might even be tuning in today might be interested in. Um, and so thank you for sharing information about that and for bringing Kali Pai um, into our program today and getting to share some of her expertise and, and her obvious passion for, for her career. Um, and I think there's so many great opportunities for students um, uh, in, in the field of environmental science. And this is just, Kali Pai's job is just one of those examples of a really awesome job that kids could get involved in someday as, as they uh, grow up. Um, so let's take a look now back over to California State Parks and talk about any native plant programs we might have. Parker, Brittany? Yeah, thank you, Jennifer. Thanks so much. I'm, we're actually just smelling in here. 
Ah, got the beautiful hummingbird sage out here. Some people like roses. I like the smell of hummingbird sage. So beautiful. Don't you think? Oh, yes. Right? So yes, great. my favorite smell. You know, those native plants are just so important, right? For pollinators, especially. I want you to see if you can guess who might enjoy this hummingbird sage. I'm sure you probably all got that. And um, also to native plants just being so important too for water conservation and even carbon storage, depending on especially those tree species like those oaks and sycamores, so important there. But again, I want to introduce you all to Brittany, who is one of our um, environmental scientists who's joining us today, who works for California State Parks, who does an awesome job about studying and uh, protecting and preserving and even restoring our environment here in our local California state parks. So um, we thought it would be fun to ask Brittany some questions here. And I want to encourage all of you to join in us. If you have questions for our environmental scientist, Brittany, um, to type those into our Q&A because we'd love to see those there. And so, all right. So I know we heard a little bit about the uh, Nita plant nursery at Elkhorn Slough. Um, do we have anything like that around here that we do? Yeah. Hi, Parker. Thank you for having me. We do have our own native plant nursery at San Buenaventura State Beach. We purchase some seed, but we collect a lot of seed and we grow plants there. And um, some of them start in little pots. And then as they get bigger, we transplant them into larger pots. And eventually we use them to plant into our restoration sites. Awesome. Yeah. That's so cool. And I, I, we have some pictures here. I'm going to bring up some pictures really quick of the native plant nursery that we have and here we are yeah here you'll see our tables and that's where we set some of our plugs and our pots um they get plenty of sunlight and we hand water them every day yeah here we go we have a species of shrub here um, we do all native plants and eventually we use them we plant them out in our parks yeah, we call these plugs. They're um, very small, kind of long type of pots. You're able to do a lot of them at one time. And eventually as these get bigger, we will put them into bigger pots and give them a little more space. And here are some of the bigger pots I was talking about. Sometimes we put them straight from seed into here and sometimes they get transplanted into these. And this is about the final size before we'll take them out and plant them into the field. Very cool. That is so neat to see that that nursery and all of those different shrubs and plants and um, tree species too that you're working to restore in our parks, especially in places like this too. I hear that you do a little bit or starting a little bit of habitat restoration um, here locally. Can you tell us about that? Yeah, very close to where we're standing right now. We have a site that we call Mariposa Reina. It used to be a large eucalyptus grove. So a eucalyptus is a non-native tree species that's very, very large. And um, there was a lot of them in this one particular area. And so state parks um, took action um, and we wanted to restore it to native plants. So we cut down all the eucalyptus trees and now we are in planning to fully restore that site. Um, however, currently we have an invasive species that has come in and filled the space that the eucalyptus were once in. Um, that one is called belt grass. So we're in the planning stages to now restore this area because we have an endemic plant species called gaviota tar plant. So an endemic species, if you don't know, is a native species that just grows in one area. So it's very special. We have this gaviota tar plant that just grows in this one area. So it's very important to protect this species. So we have mapped the belt grass and we will show you that map. And um, now we were planning how to fully restore um, this area and get the tar plant the space that it needs and the resources that it needs, the light, the water to grow and be successful. So here in the orange, that is currently where we have belt grass and we're planning on restoring this area. Very cool. And then I know I brought, I'm bringing up another slide here to show everyone what the um, gaviota tar plant looks like, which is that top one up here. 
This is our friend, the Gaviota tar plant. Yes. And then also the Vandenberg monkey flower at another site here locally too at La Prisma Mission, right? Yes. At the mission, you can find another awesome endemic plant that we have called the Vandenberg monkey flower. And that endemic plant is also impacted by velt grass. And we are currently have active restoration at that site where we are removing the velt grass um, and giving the Vandenberg monkey flower the, the space that it needs. Yeah. And then if you look on the invasive side too, you can see what that belt grass looks like there. It just looks like a grass, right? And grasses yeah. can be hard to identify too, right? They're very tricky. They all look very similar. Yes. yes. <laughs> awesome. And then I have one more question here before we turn it back to Jennifer in Virginia there. Um, and so since you are an environmental scientist, and I'm sure we might have some uh, folks joining us today who might inspire to be an environmental scientist. Can you tell us a little bit about what it takes to do your job? Like, what are some cool things about it? Maybe what you might study in school or anything like that. Yeah, I love my job. Actually, before I came out here, I got to check on some bird nests. It's bird nesting season right now. So that's one of my favorite things to do, but that's just one of many things that we do as an environmental scientist. Um, I got my bachelor's in biology and I'm getting my master's in biology. So with a little bit of education and I would say a big curious mind, um, you can be an environmental scientist. It's we we're out here working with the plants and, and the wildlife and we're very curious about our world and our earth and trying to protect um, the, the resources around us. I love that. That's yeah. so cool. And We'll send it back to you, Jennifer. And again, if you have any questions for our environmental scientist, Brittany, you can share those with us. Thanks, Brittany, for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you, partner. And Brittany, I, I mean, I have to just say it, it is so exciting to have um, some special guest environmental scientists joining us today, like Kali Pai uh, over at Elkhorn Slough and you, Brittany, there with California State Parks working out of the Channel Coast District. And, and the incredible work that you have the opportunity to do, and you're also clearly passionate about, about your job and, and the line of work that you get to do. And I think that really translates here. And I think it's, it's really, it's just a great opportunity to get to share that with the students that are tuning in today. So thank you again for, again, the work that you're doing and for sharing this information in our, our special Portscast program today. Um, before we move into our Q&A segment, which is the last part of our program today, um, I, I want to turn things back over to Virginia so that she can share with us a little bit about a really cool art contest that everyone that's tuning in today can participate in. So Virginia, I'm going to turn things over to you to tell us all about that art contest. Wonderful. Thanks, Jennifer. And thanks, everybody there with State Parks for inviting us in today to join with this Ports cast around this very important topic of invasive species. So I began talking to you uh, several minutes ago, and we talked about our the, the importance of understanding invasive species and how critical this is for the Department of Fish and Wildlife to address. So one of the things that we do is we host during the month of June, Invasive Species Awareness Week. So it's a time for us to talk about invasive species like we're doing today and raise awareness of Californians of the problems and also the actions that we can take around invasive species to kick off a little early, but to kick off Invasive Species Awareness Week that's in June, we have started an Invasive Species Art Contest. So that art contest is open right now to all of you, to students all over California. Our deadline for submission is May 3rd. So I'm guessing all your teachers are writing this down that you can create any kind of form of art around the topic of invasive species. Tell us what an invasive species is. Tell us what you don't like, which one you don't like the most. Uh, how do you deal with it? What can we do about them? All of these are possible topics for your art piece. That is again, submission date is May 3rd, so it's coming up fast, but jump on it, get involved. This is your opportunity to do something to help us raise awareness in California around the problem of invasive species. And before I hand it back, I just want to say um, thank you again. But I want to say that the California Department of Fish and Wildlife owns over owns and manages over a million acres of land across California. And we 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 
we look at these lands as we want to protect, we want to preserve. And what, do we, what are we protecting and preserving? We're protecting and preserving the native wildlife, um, the plants, the habitats that we find these wildlife in. And we're doing that for the enjoyment of all Californians. And so an invasive species effort is just one part of what we do as an agency to, um, to protect these really critical habitats. Again, for the enjoyment of all Californians. So. A special thank you to State Parks for inviting our agency and inviting myself and the Elkhorn Slew Reserve to be part of this important conversation. And um, we're ready for some questions. So what do you have for us? Awesome, fantastic. And you know, Virginia, I couldn't agree with you more. And I know that Parker and Jen and Brittany there also would agree that this has just been such a great collaboration such an amazing opportunity for us to come together and work towards a very important common goal. And that is to restore our native ecosystems to the best of our ability. We've, we've got a lot of work, right? We've got a lot of work ahead of us, but we have a lot of people that really care about this. And we have a lot of students out there that are watching right now that probably care about this too. So get involved. You know, like Virginia said, if you're interested in that art contest, um, by the way, there's a link to that art contest in our program description. So teachers, uh, go back to our program description and click on that link and you'll get all the information you need for submitting your, uh, your students' artwork. And uh, again, like Virginia said, May 3rd. So there's still time to participate in that. Um, and, and again, there's obviously there's programs in our parks as well, volunteer opportunities, uh, beach cleanups, you name it, there's a million ways that you can think to contribute um, to helping our and to bettering our ecosystems um, and our parks and, and all of our natural and wild spaces. Um, so we invite you to be a part of that endeavor. Um, and, and thank you guys all for, for coming together and making this happen today. Because again, this, this was a really just such a fun collaboration and an important one, right? Um, so we do have some questions coming in. And Virginia, as a matter of fact, we have a student that was asking after you were talking about the art contest and the student asked, can I make a video for the art contest? Yeah, absolutely. So art is art. Any sort of medium that you want to use, crayons, colored pencils, cut and paste glue, collages, make a video, um, make a sound piece, make a song. All of that is absolutely what we want to see is your self-expression telling us about invasive species. Very good. Yeah, perfect. So, so it's, it's really the, 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 the world is your oyster, you know, you, you get the creative license to come up with some ideas on how you'd like to participate in this and, and use whatever medium you'd like. Um, so again, we invite you to be a part of this really, really awesome art contest. So we have another question. Um, I'm kind of sifting through the Q&A right now. And I think either one of you might be able to answer this. Uh, let me see if I can find that one again. Um, <clears throat> oh, why does the red-legged frog not have red legs? <laughs> can anyone answer that? <laughs> oh, Virginia, you're muted. Oh, yeah. So great <laughs> question. When you look at them from the outside, yeah, they're they're greens and browns and things like that, but they actually do have red legs. That's just on the inside of their legs that you see the red. So you'd have to turn them over. Uh, and it's and not I, bright red. It's kind of a pink color. <laughs> yes. And I've had the opportunity to see that myself. So I know it's true. And uh, and it was obviously a, a, a obvious, curious question that I would have asked too, just looking at the picture that we saw. Um, so we got another uh, question that came into the Q&A about uh, if you can catch and eat crawfish. Now, I know I made a mention of that. Parker, I think you might have an answer. Yeah, definitely. Jennifer here. Yeah, you can. You do need a fishing permit and you'll also need a, a crayfish uh, permit if you're going to catch them for uh, uh, human consumption. So, yeah, you do want to check into uh, permits for that but you can catch and eat them. I heard Because you want to make, there are uh, native crayfish, so you want to also make sure that you're catching the invasive ones, not the native ones. Yeah, heard they're delicious though. So, and we, it gives us a full appetite when they're not in our park. <laughs> <laughs> I can totally agree with that. And I don't know, I don't have firsthand experience what crawfish tastes like, but 
I certainly don't want to confront one after the picture I saw today. <laughs> uh, Virginia, a question came in, and uh, honestly, I'm not sure if I know how to pronounce it, but the student wants to know if they could have a, an ac axolotl. I don't know how to say it as a pet. Do you know what I'm referring to? The axolotl. Axolotl? Axolotl. Axolotl. <laughs> Axolotl. It's it's in the amphibian family, right? It's ah, a, it's yes. it's a salamander. It's in that in that world. And is the question, can you have one as a pet? That's a great question. I I honestly don't know. Um, <laughs> I don't does it, either. Parker, do you know? Can you have an axolotl as a pet? I am not really sure. No, and I, I always I always hesitate to to think about bringing something that's naturally a wild species and not naturally a pet species into your home. So that would be my, my thoughts about it. Yeah. yeah they're native to um, like Mexico, like the caves in Mexico area. Cause they are, I think similar to salamanders. Um, but I don't know what the, the rules are about having them as pets for California. Yeah. I don't believe you can have them, but you know, I think it's one of those, species that's a part of the pet trade and I think it's something that's important to you to think about um, whether it's a plant or animal think about what you're planting or taking home right that's you right you definitely want to release it into the environment <laughs> that's right I was gonna bring that's that right. up that was... that's our that's our motto don't let it loose don't let yeah. it loose well I guess we'll if this begs for a little bit more research we'll have to find out what, what kind of amphibians are are okay to have as pets but whatever amphibians you do have as pets don't let it loose don't That's forget right. that message that was pretty important you know guys i have to share with you and as i'm um, scrolling through our q a there's a lot of comments about how cool our jobs are and how awesome and fun this was um like and so job. thank you everyone that uh that is sharing some of your um, comments about that today um there was another question about how um students can get involved with getting rid of invasive species like what what sort of things can can they do and i know we've talked a little bit about that but a, a question did just come in they want to know about what what can kids do to get rid of invasive species like a at home or when yeah home just do you want to share like oh. yeah so kelly probably can answer or give some ideas about what what can you do about invasive species well i think first learn which ones are the native species get to know them and then as you go out like if you're planting at home or if you're going on a, a a walk or a hike, you can get involved in volunteer invasive invasive species removal mm. projects. Um, but but definitely starts with knowing the native plants first. Absolutely, and I I know we've had a lot of um, uh, student groups come out to some of the parks that I've worked at, and 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 just get involved even in just some native planting, um, and helping us in in uh, bringing native plants yeah. back. So, you know, there's there's the part where you can be involved with removing um, some of the non-native, but you could also be involved in bringing native plants back into our, our, our wild spaces. So there's a variety of things I feel like students could do. Participating in a program like this and, and doing the art contest and just growing your knowledge and becoming a stewardship of our parks is something that is easy to do and all students that are tuning in today um, should should become stewards and and help us in this big fight against invasive species. Um, so I think you know this brings our our program to a conclusion today. Again, this has been such a, an amazing collaboration and and working and working together is what we have to do to restore our ecosystems. What was the saying I used at the beginning of the program? Teamwork is dream work, and we, we can do that. And students can get involved and be a part of that endeavor as well. Um, so the last thing I wanna share with everybody, um, this program is brought to you by the PortsCast um, platform, which is part of the Ports program. And I do just wanna share with you all really quick, the Ports website. So teachers and students that are tuning in right now, um, I encourage you to go to ports.com parks.ca.gov and take a look at some of our ports programs that we have. We have on-demand programs, which is a, a program between a, a park site and a classroom. And so it's a really highly interactive live program, which is a lot of fun. Parker and Jen do, the, do those programs all the time. 
And we have ports cast like you guys are all tuning into today. We have a whole calendar of ports cast programs that you can get involved in. Earth Day and Earth Week is next week. We have a whole bunch of ports cast programs scheduled next week. So teachers, students, if this looks like something you're interested in, please sign up for some of our other ports casts or sign up for one of our ports on demand programs as well. Stay involved, stay connected to your parks, become stewards, and again, help us in this incredible fight to save our, our wild lands and, and um, clean up our ecosystems, get rid of those invasive species and bring in all the stuff that belongs here. So thank you again, everybody. Parker, love it. <laughs> it. Let's give you guys, let's give ourselves a nice big round of applause. Thank you so much. And thank you for everybody that joined us today. And maybe we'll see you next week. Bye, Thanks, everyone. Guys. Thank you.